Sunday where we encourage everyone, if they wish, to wear a shirt of their favorite team, be it high school, college, professional, whatever. And the church gifted me and Pastor John and Pastor Lynette with a shirt from our schools uh, with the year that we were born. <laughs> you know, they said, what number do you put on a jersey? How do you pick? So they put the year we were born, has our name on the back. I, I thought I might have to go in and play yesterday. We were struggling. <laughs> But thank you. This is a, a great day, and that's why we have the banners of the various teams up here. And it's a great day of celebration. We're going to have a meal afterwards. And as I was preparing this message, it's going to be quite different than what I normally do, uh, in that um, I just want to share my experience and, and share what God has, has done in my life and what this week has meant to me. Uh, by the way, I hope to, uh, the plan is right now to share more detail Wednesday night on some, uh, some of the things. I can't get, I could talk for hours, literally, and, and I'm not really just a talker by nature, so that's telling you something. Uh, but I want to start with a theme, first of all, for this message, and uh, Kirk and I were talking about different things, and he said one thing that he has used in talking about children of promise is help today, hope tomorrow. Help today and hope for tomorrow. Because that's what Children of Promise provides. This is not simply a commercial for Children of Promise, though I will talk extensively about it, since that's the group with whom I went. Uh, but it's, it's about more than that. It's about our mission to the world, because that's what this is all about. I want to share a couple of scriptures. Jesus in Matthew 25, remember, said that inasmuch as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. And then in 1 John 3, 17, it says that if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? I have some notes I jotted down uh, on the airplane yesterday, and I decided I'm just going to share some of these things just to remind myself of what I want to tell you today. And so let me first begin by giving you some general information about the Philippines that you may not know, many that I didn't know ahead of time. The Philippines is an Asian nation, which you saw on the map perhaps at the beginning, and it is made up of 7,000 islands. Isn't that a lot? The 7,000 islands. But it has a, a great American influence, also Spanish. They actually use pesos there, but uh, also a great American influence. And so it wasn't as much culture shock as you might get traveling to some other Asian countries. Uh, the, the food there, though, is quite Asian, and in fact, Paul Slayton asked me today if I ate a balut. A balut. Kirk did. Wait till you hear what a balut is. It is an egg that has developed enough to where there is a duck inside with eyes and a beak and feet and all that. And they eat that. I mean, one lady said she'll eat two or three at a time. And on Thursday night, we stopped at this place where you can buy them, and uh, the guy, our driver ate one. I mean, he drinks, they call it the amniotic fluid. He takes off the top of the eggshell, and he drinks it, puts a little salt on it, and then he feels enough of that. Now, we want to enjoy our lunch, right? So I'll quit there. I'm, the question has been called for. Uh, I found out that cockfighting is legal in the Philippines. But get this, I was asking about the stability of the family and so forth. They said there's no divorce in the Philippines. I said, well, what do you mean no divorce? I said, what if someone doesn't want to live with somebody? And they said, well, they have a legal separation, but there is no divorce. And so if I'm understanding that correctly, you won't find somebody who's had four or five or six wives or husbands because there's no divorce. But it was interesting. The people there are very kind, very kind. Now, I know I spent most of the time in the church community but the Filipinos themselves are known for being kind people. And I was on the plane and going over from Tokyo to Manila. Uh, I was sitting next to a girl who grew up in the Philippines who now lives in Tennessee, and she was going for a visit. And she said, people there are always smiling. Now, I know they have people who are grumpy like everybody else, and they have their, they'd actually have a, a drug issue too, and they, you know, they have some violence. But uh, for the most part, I felt very safe uh, walking around. I didn't go far. And uh, when we left the hotel, we only went out a couple of times by ourselves. You, know, you stick out like a sore thumb. But the, the, the security guard at the hotel said, put your wallet in your front pocket, you know, and stay together, those kinds of things. So, you know, there, is, there are those issues, too, like any other country. But it is a very kind, kind place. Uh, how, I want to tell you how I came about this trip, because it was unusual in that I was gone two weeks ago in Philadelphia 
for our Church of God conference, uh, a regional conference there, and was planning on being back uh, that nice last week. And, uh, and uh, on Tuesday, well, the first day of the conference, uh, Kirk Bookout, who's pre spoken here before, a good friend of mine, kind of almost jokingly says, although he was serious too, you know, you, you want to go to the Philippines. He had no idea if I even owned a passport, but he said, would you want to go to the Philippines? Well, I want you to know something. This is not something I just jumped at, because... I am not a world traveler. I have never been outside of North America. I have a little bit of uneasiness about going to some foreign countries because I hear stories. I don't want to get malaria. I don't want to bring back the Zika virus and have my name all over the national news. He did it. You know, I mean, it, it's like I, I have a little bit of uneasiness about some of this stuff. So I wasn't like, sure, let's go. I mean, so I, it took me a week. He told me on Tuesday. It wasn't until the next Tuesday that I, I fully was convinced that this is what uh, God wanted me to do. And so it was one of those things that it was way outside my comfort zone. But I want to tell you why I went. And by the way, first before I forget, thank you for your support. You have encouraged me. Uh, you have prayed for me. And you have supported me uh, financially. And, you know, there are a lot of churches I was confident that you would say go. Because I didn't have time. I got back from Philadelphia uh, late Sunday, and then I didn't have time to call the church together and say, hey, what do you all think? But I was confident that you would say, go, and I appreciate that. That means a lot to me, that you care about people a far, far away, that uh, you encourage me that way. Let me tell you why this did appeal to me, unlike a lot of other things that might not. When Kirk mentioned it to me, there are several things that went to my mind. One of them was the children. This wasn't going on a mission trip to build a church or lay a road, and those things are valuable. That's not my cup of tea. But I thought, I get to interview children. I love kids. And that appealed to me. A second reason it appealed to me was because it was the Philippines. And I, uh, we went to school with a girl from the Philippines. And my cousin married a girl from the Philippines. And I, I thought, you know, this, is, this country is more American friendly than a lot. It, you know, this isn't Bangladesh. This isn't Iran. This isn't Kazakhstan. This is the Philippines. And I thought, OK, I, you know, for my first overseas trip, this, this might work, OK? And the third reason, which is a strong influence too, was Jamela, the child that we sponsor. And I thought, you know, if I could meet her, you know, that'd be awesome. And I'll tell you more about that. Rusty and Lynette also have a child in the Philippines that they sponsor. I wish I could have met her, but she had exams the day we were doing the, uh, the interviews and she just couldn't make it, but maybe on some future trip. And can you believe I'm talking about a future trip? I mean, what's going on here? This is so crazy. Another reason I, I, I felt like God was leading me this way is I felt like it would be a life-changing experience. I thought, you know, you, this, this could alter your life, the course of your life, and it has already. I, I know, and you'll see why in just a little bit. Another reason why I felt compelled to go is I felt like I would regret it if I didn't. I, I felt like God would say, William, I laid an opportunity right out there in front of you, and you didn't take it. And I felt like I had to go. I felt like I needed to. Um, I, I could have gone another year, like two years down the road or something. But here's the sixth reason why I felt compelled to go, was that Kirk needed help. They usually take a team. And he had four people who were lined up to go a, a couple of months ago. But one had a medical emergency, and the others had some really legitimate things that came up, and they couldn't make it. And you know, he was leaving in a week, and he's, he's looking for somebody. He's asking everybody, and then he saw me. And of course, like I said, we're good friends. And so he asked me, and I didn't really. And in fact, one of my questions I kept asking him when I was trying to decide was, "How much do you need me? I mean, do you really need me? I mean, is, how much?" And you know, when, on the the Sunday afternoon, or my first day there, we walked into a school in the afternoon to interview, and there, and there were fifty kids there. And it hit me: if Kirk were by himself, that would take four or five hours. That's a lot of work, because it, 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 you have to really focus when you're interviewing, because first of all, it's hard to understand many of them, and there's noise because of fans moving. They don't have air conditioning there, so you have all this noise. You have to, it's really hard to, to really focus that long. And so I, I realized that having another person, and that we could have used another one, actually, but it really helped because we interviewed, uh, I interviewed myself 183 children over six days, and he interviewed, I'm sure, about the same number. So we got a lot accomplished, over 360 kids uh, interviewed. And I'll tell you why the interview was done in just a moment. Uh, Paul Maxfield in that Children of Promise video said it's about accountability. Uh, that was one of our purposes in going, and I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on that. And the seventh reason I felt compelled to go is because it was Kirk. 
You know, Kirk has been a friend of mine for 27 years. He was my supervising pastor when I was a young minister looking to be ordained. And, uh, you know, going with him, I felt very comfortable. You know, because it's one of those things, if you want to say, well, I'm going to go to my room right now and relax, or I'll meet you down for breakfast later if you're going down. You can say that to a friend, and you know, you're not going to have to worry, oh, they're going to be offended. You know what I mean? Somebody you don't know, but somebody that you've known for 27 years, you know, you can, you can kind of do that thing. We can, we can joke and all that. So it was, it was good. So I go, and in the Philippines, we have 586 children, the Church of God does, that are sponsored by people here in the United States. And that is the third most of any country in the world. Only Uganda and Tanzania have more children sponsored by people in the Children of Promise. And it was really funny because, you see, the way it's set up is they have a team over there. And you saw a picture of, of Grace uh, Family Helper Project. That's their Children of Promise program. And so they have a staff that oversees the program. And we go over there to interview the kids, and it's a, it's a way for accountability. We interview the kids every three years, the children are required to be interviewed. And that makes sure that they're getting what they need, that their health is good, that they're getting the education, that they're involved in the church. And so it's all about accountability. And it was funny because they have 586, and I told the, the, the social worker that, that is, kind of runs the program, I, I, I told her I'd be talking about, I said, I'm going to be talking about the Philippines on Sunday. I said, I have a whole service. And she says, well, maybe by, the, by Sunday we'll have 600. Instead of 586, you know, maybe some of your church will say, I want to support. And then she goes, maybe 700. <laughs> calm down now, calm down. She gets excited. So it was kind of funny. She said, yeah, what, what, whatever we can do. But I want to, what we did then during the day, and the thing that meant the most to me, other than meeting our child, uh, was, was going and visiting the, the slums of Manila. I, it was, I mean, interviewing the kids was meaningful. But you have to understand that we didn't get a picture of their lives until we went to their homes. Because the, the interview is a big deal to them. You know, only, only you can see Americans come in and interview them once every three years. This is a big deal. Some of them were so nervous. Like, you know, like they're being, and we told them ahead of time, there are no wrong answers, it's easy, and all that kind of stuff. But you know, it's kind of nervous for them to meet these Americans coming over to talk to them. But in terms of the poverty there, Manila, is the most densely populated city in the entire world. There are, and I want you to think about this, for every square mile in Manila, there are 107,000 people. One square mile, 107,000 people. I did some research, and there is not another city in the world that even comes close. The next closest city has 79,000 people per square mile. I mean, that's not even close to Manila. 107,000 people per square mile. And the children being born at, a, at a, just an astronomical rate. I mean, so many per second, and it just so it continues to, to get worse. And visiting the slum areas, well, let me put it this way. Kirk asked me to speak into his camera one day while we were in one of those areas because he wants me to tell my, my experience in one minute to try to encourage other people to make such trips. And here's what I said, basically. I said, I grew up in the United States, and like you, I've heard the stories, I've seen the pictures, I've watched the videos of poverty around the world, but it wasn't until I came here to the Philippines that I was able to walk where they walk, to smell what they smell, to see the environment in which they live in, that I was able to get a better picture. And I really don't think, and I think about this myself, I, I, as long as I was here in America, I, and I don't think any of us, if we don't go, we can never really, really understand what it's like. That this is their reality every single day. And even I don't, unless I go and live with them. So even I, even though I was there, I can't really understand it. I can't really comprehend what their reality is unless you are in it all the time with no hope, really, of, of ever being delivered about, out of that. For example... And when I say house, you know, I want you to know I'm using that word loosely. You know, it might be a, a room that, like the room that, the, the, the house that Jamela lives in with her family is about eight feet wide, maybe 12 feet long. That's their house. They share a communal bathroom with others in that same area. That's where they live. Uh, we were in this one house where they had a little room like that, and then a little loft they had built, and there were about eight or nine people living there, and they said they have to sh sleep in shifts 
because there's not enough room for everybody to lay down at the same time. So they sleep in shifts. There was a picture in the video of this woman at a sewing machine, and she's, uh, she does that, and she makes little rags, and sells them for just a few pesos, which is next to nothing. 45 pesos in the Philippines is one dollar. So if you sell something for you know, 20 pesos, I mean, it's less than 50 cents. And there was a, I don't know if you saw, if you remember, that there was a little thing, a little area behind her. That's, it's, it's no bigger than the bed of a pickup truck. And that's where she lives. And so when she lies down at night, that's where she, when she wakes up, that's, that's her home. And there are a bunch of other people who live in that same area. And, and that's where they live day by day. And you know, when you walk among that, it just really hits you. You know, first of all, how much we have in America, it's just mind-boggling in comparison, but to think that they live this way every day. You know, they, they, in the video, there was a picture of us walking across planks, or in, the, in, the, in one little bridge that they had built out of wood, and it was one of the worst areas that we saw. And there were dozens upon dozens of people living among, amid garbage, because there had been a flood there and all this garbage. That's why they, we had to walk across like three, series, three sets of planks because they had elevated because of the flooding. And to get to their home, we had to walk across those planks. And Kirk was afraid we were going to fall, you know, which caused, or that they were going to break through because they were, they seemed kind of weak to get to where they lived. And it just breaks your heart. You know, while, while we're sitting here in this comfortable sanctuary, it is almost midnight there, and they're going to bed in those poverty stricken areas and they're waking up the next morning with no hope of really things getting improved for the most part. And it, in fact, I have three pictures I asked them to show this morning to kind of get a picture uh, of, of this. This is just a, a normal, now not every street is like this, that's why I took a picture here. And it, and, but this is just a, a, a city street in Manila. I mean, can you imagine driving in Tulsa and, and seeing that? And go to the next picture. Uh, this, is, this is what I was talking about, the little bridge they had built. There was another area, if, you keep on, you know, if we kept on walking uh, we, uh, behind those, some of those buildings, we had to walk across. There were elevated planks, I mean, about, you know, about uh, you know, a couple feet wide at that, that we had to walk across to get to where these people lived. And all, you see the garbage there because of that little river there that flooded. And by the way, there was another area that had flooded. The water got up over their windows, and the Children of Promise, because they have an emergency fund, actually helped them to rebuild their area a little bit. That's another thing Children of Promise does. And then one other picture that I want to show. It's hard to kind of see the details here, but that's a roof. And it's just a bunch of stuff laying on top and, and bricks and things like that. You know when it rains, it's not very watertight. So yeah, that's, what, that's what they have to deal with. All the time. And Kirk made this observation, I thought it was very interesting, after we went and saw some of these houses. He said, you know, when in America, we think of a house as a place where we go to escape. You know, we say, well, I want to get home and just sit in my recliner and maybe read the newspaper, or watch the news, get, get a cup of tea. And we think, well, I want to go home and escape, get away from everything and just relax. And he said to me, could you imagine going to one of these houses to relax? Why would you wouldn't? In fact, I noticed that there were people outside all the time. And we, we'd be driving out you know, at nighttime, and the streets are just packed. And they're, they're just hanging out, walking, just doing whatever. And I asked them, I said, is one reason why people are out so much is because there's no reason to go home? And they said, yeah. The only reason you go home is because you're a family. But other than that, why, why would you want to be there? all the time. If you, all you have is a, is a little area like that woman with the sewing machine, and that's, she's got to lie to maybe a three foot by eight foot place to lie down. Why would you want to say, hey, I can't wait to get home? You know, here in America, we say that all the time, but we wouldn't say that there. There's no privacy. There's uh, no air conditioning anywhere you go, except, you know, maybe, I mean, the hotels and things like that might have some air conditioning, but, but generally speaking, uh, people don't have, well, even the hosts that we were with, because they, they, uh, yeah, these are, one woman, for example, is the wife of a pastor. She's a social worker. You think, oh, okay, well-educated woman. She probably has some money, right? Uh, they don't have hot water in their home. Uh, they don't have microwaves. The things that we take for granted here in America. Our week unfolded like this, to give you an idea of what we were doing. One of the main reasons that we, we went, of course, was to interview the children. It's part of our, our way to to ask the staff of things that they need, things that are going well, things that maybe aren't going so well, how can we help? 
Also to make sure that the children are getting what they need, making sure the, that uh, you know, all the supplies are getting to them, that they're involved in the church and so forth. And that was the, but the, really the big intent behind all the interviews was to develop a relationship with the kids. That was because the, the questions, the answers they gave us were not, most, for the most part, and thus it involved their health, wasn't something that we're going to really uh, follow up on in a, in a significant way, I don't think. But it was mainly to develop a relationship. You know, let them know, hey, there's a face here. It's not that this Children of Promise thing really exists in America, and, and we're here to, to, on their behalf. And, and so that was really part of it, to develop that relationship with, with the kids. And the, but the, but the, the answers that they gave us on a lot of these were very revealing. Now, I want you to think about this in comparison with America. We would ask these kids, for example, what's the best thing that's happened to you this year? What's the best thing? And several kids would say, go into the park. I mean, think about that. You can go to the park anytime you want. But for them, that's special. Or going to the mall. Because it takes a little while to get to the mall, and they don't have transportation in the mall. They can't afford public transportation. This really blew me away. I said, what's the best thing that's happened to you this year? And I'm, about eight or nine kids said this, or something similar. I got to meet you. And it just, it just broke your heart. And I want you to understand something. It was not about me or Kirk. It could have been anybody. It could have been any of you too. Some of them said, when I said, what's the best thing happened to you today or this year? He said, today. Or getting to meet people from Children of Promise. Yeah, this is October. It's been a pretty long year, almost 10 months. And that was the best thing that's happened to them. And Kirk and I talked about this later. And, and you know, you think about that song in the video where they're saying, thank you, thank you. And Kirk and I were saying to each other, you know, they're not, because they treated us like rock stars. It was really embarrassing. I'm not kidding. I mean, they wanted our autographs. They wanted pictures with us. They had welcome signs. I don't know where they got that picture of me on that sign. But, I mean, they were really prepared. They, they treated us like we were royalty. But Kirk and I were saying to each other, you know, it's, it's not me and it's not him. Like I said, it could have been anybody. They wanted to thank their sponsors. They wanted to, they can't come here and thank Rusty and Lynette personally, but they can say to me and Kirk, thank you, thank you for showing his love. And that way they're thanking their sponsor. So we were just representatives, and it was so special. Many times, this, uh, this really blew me away too. We'd also ask them, what's the worst thing that happened to you this year? I would guess 25 to 30 percent of the kids said this. What's the worst thing that happened to you this year? Nothing. Now this is awesome. This, these kids are living in extreme poverty. I, mean, I, saw, I saw kids taking a bath in a bucket, not a bathtub, but a little bucket with water where you prime the pump. And I asked them, what's the worst thing that happened? They didn't say, oh, taking a bath outside in the mud. No, they said, nothing. I mean, it is amazing how content they are. You know, we, we, we grumble over some of the smallest things here in America, and yet they're, they're, they're just content. They, they just are, they take it all in stride. It's, it's pretty an amazing thing. And they, they, don't, they didn't complain. The, the, one of the worst things, that, the, the, the saddest things, I think some of the things they shared was, you know, my grandmother died this year. One woman, one little girl said, my mother died. Uh, two months ago. And that was one of those put your pin down moments where, okay, I'm not interested in the interview now. Let's minister to this child who just lost her mom. You know, and that happens in America, I know. Where, but, um, but I couldn't believe how many people just said, I can't think of anything. My life is good. My life is good. Can you imagine living in those places? Because see, these places, the pictures we showed you, these aren't just <coughs> random homes out there. These are homes that the sponsored children live in. Okay, see, when, I, when we went with, with them in the church, like on Monday morning, for example, we went to a church. And sometimes we had to drive three hours to get to the church, sometimes two hours. And there were, and there were a few closer to Manila. And we would meet with them in the church, and every group had a program where they sang songs in a, you know, about 15, 20 minutes, and they introduced us. And then we interviewed the children. And then on about three, I think four occasions, we went to their homes. And it was, it was in these Homes that we showed you. These were not just, we didn't just pick the worst of the worst. These were the homes of kids that are sponsored through Children of Promise. And that's where they're living. 
And yet these are the kids, when I ask them, what's the worst thing that's happened to you this year? No, nothing. Nothing bad. It's been a good year, you know? Pretty amazing. Now let me tell you about our child. And uh, I wasn't sure when I first said I'd go that it would even work out because we didn't actually go. We, the plan wasn't really to go to her church and, and like we did the others because of time. You know, you can only go to so many. But this, these people, our hosts who run the Children of Promise program in the Philippines were awesome. And here we had had a full day on Thursday where we went to a church in the morning, interviewed all the kids, went to another church in the afternoon, interviewed the kids. And, you know, normally we'd, have, we'd be done, we'd get home about 7 o'clock. But... They had arranged, when they found out I was coming, for us to go and meet Jamela. And so it took another at least three hours for us to drive to her house, spend an hour there, then drive back. And our hosts did that for me. It was pretty cool. And incidentally, this child that we sponsor was begun uh, by Luke. The sponsorship was begun by Luke uh, in 2012 uh, when he was still in high school. And then when he got too poor, <laughs> uh, we, we said, you know what, we'll take it over. We didn't want to do this anyway. And so we took over the sponsorship about three years ago. But I thought you might want to know that Luke was the one who began that. Isn't that cool? He's, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't even have gone to the Philippines. Uh, so, so Luke had begun that. And so I got to spend about an hour, uh, at, again, at her house, which I say is you know, one room. And there was a little bed. And you know, when, I, when they say a kitchen area, it's about a three-foot area by that far. And it was like a propane in the, in the corner and that's their kitchen, you know. And they try to make, they get there and, and of course they, they all try to sleep in that same room. In the picture you may have noticed that there were no parents. Let me tell you about her story real quick. Her father passed away last year right before Christmas. He was 30 years old and he had a heart attack. Uh, and her mother was working. And, but here, here's something that happens a lot with these poverty stricken families. You see, her mom works a distance away and she's gone Monday through Friday. I mean, she's gone all week because she has to work in the home. She's, they call it a domestic helper. And so she works in this home all week long doing chores, gets paid piddly for it, you know. Um, but she has to do something. And so Jamela actually takes care. You saw, we have a picture, right, of her with her little brother. This is her little brother. Love his smile. He's got a great <laughs> smile. And then that's her little sister. And Jamela's on the right. She's 13. And so Jamela takes care of her little brother and her little sister all week long. And she's 13 years old. Now her aunts live in an adjacent room. And her grandmother lives there. And they help, of course, like when Jamela's in school. Uh, but largely the responsibility is on her when her mother's working Monday through Friday. Then her mom comes home on the weekends. And that's how they're living uh, their lives right now. She wants to be a nurse when she grows up and come to America. That would be so awesome. And let me tell you something. This would not be possible without Children of Promise. Because they wouldn't have the educational opportunities, for one thing, if it weren't for Children of Promise. And they have the support of the church through Children of Promise. I wanted so badly just to bring her home to Oklahoma Thursday. I, I, just, I just wanted to just say, hey, why don't you come, come with me and Cindy? But, and I want to tell you how much of a leap that is for me. We, are, we have the empty nest, and I'm liking it. <laughs> And for me to say, even to man, of course, I didn't say this to her. This is just what was going through my head. I just, I mean, she was just so sweet and kind. And, you know, you see their living situation. And you just want to take them and say, Let's, hey, why don't you just come with us? But you know what? You know, we, th we think so much like Americans. And Cindy and I have talked about this. I've talked with Kirk about it. Not that I, again, not that that was an option. But here's what we were talking about. Who are we to think that she would even want to leave? She's quite happy. Why would she want to leave without, or live without her brother and her sister and her mother? It's not like she's an orphan. And she also has her grandmother and her aunts. It, see, here's something that's very different in the Philippines than in America and in a lot of other countries, too. You know, in the Philippines, extended family is major. In America, I mean, I know it's important, but not like in the Philippines. And so their extended family is close. They often live close together. And so Jamela and her brother and sister live... Right there with, you know, her aunt lives in a little room off. And it's a house. It's a separate house, but it's really just a room. And they all, you know, they watch out for each other. In America, you see it sometimes, but not as often. And so, you know, what ego and what 
American pride there would be if I said, well, you'd be better off with us. She probably didn't think so. She's very happy. And so, you see, we think about this in American terms, and so, you know, we have to think the way they think and realize they, 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 they're, they're not sitting around saying, poor, poor me, even in the midst of their, of their poverty. And it was interesting because I got back in the van after I visited with her, and I'm not a really emotional person, but I was that night. Um, in part, for one thing, I never thought I'd ever get to meet her, and I wish Cindy could meet her, but I think she will someday. She will. But you know, also the poverty, and you know, I I, had a, I was talking to the rest who were in the van. There were about five or six, and I really would have loved to have visited two more hours, but I knew they were all waiting on me. I didn't want to hold them up. But um, I said to Kirk, you know, and the others in the van, I said, I, you, know, you just want to do more. You know what I mean? You just want to do more. And Kirk made this comment, which really hit me. He said. He said, you know, you're wishing you could do more, but I'm thinking about what you're doing that's providing opportunities for her that she would never have. And that helped put it in perspective a little bit. It still breaks your heart, but, but that sure helped. I'm getting near the end. I know you're thinking, how long is he going to go? But let me share a few more things with you, okay? <laughs> Because I want you to see the success of this program. And a lot of times, by the way, parents get saved too. See, the church involvement is a requirement for this program. And they understand that up front. Okay? If they're not willing to be involved in a church, my understanding is then that then they can't be a part of the Children of Promise program. It's part of the whole connection. And, you know, a lot of the parents get saved. At one church, the parents of the children got up and did a song that they had prepared for us. And so many, in many cases, the parents get saved too. It's a great evangelistic uh, tool. And, and now here's one of the success stories. One of the, the ladies is part of the staff. Uh, she uh, has four daughters, and her 21-year-old daughter, her name is Jewel, uh, is, uh, was in the Children of Promise program as she was growing up. And again, now she's 21 years old, and I want to show you this picture, the next picture, the last picture I want to show. That's her on the right. The guy on the left is the former president of the Philippines, okay? The girl... On the right, who's part of the Children of Promise program, her name is Jewel, she's 21, she works for the president 